All right, hello everybody. And today we're gonna to be evaluating this integral right here using complex analysis. So I've already calculated this integral using Laplace transforms, which gave us the result of pi over e, but we wanna use some complex analysis today to reevaluate it a little bit. So let's just get started here. First of all, we needed to find for ourselves a new complex function. So let's just take the usual approach for this type of integrands right here. We're going to let some new function, we're gonna call it f of z, be equal to z, and then I'm gonna replace the sine of x with e to the i z, and then I'm gonna divide everything by z squared plus one like so. And those on the denominator right here, we're going to have two zeros. So what that means is that we have two poles for our function. So if you factor the denominator a bit, just use difference of two squares because this is exactly minus i squared because i squared is negative one, negative and negative one is a positive one. So if you just split the denominator up a little bit, you should get z plus i and z minus i. And letting the denominator equal to zero, you're gonna have two poles at z equals i and z equals minus i, and this will be useful later on. Okay, so we've defined for ourselves a function, we've figured out where the poles are, now we have to figure out what our contour will be. And for this type of integral, it would be nice to use the semicircular contour. So if you imagine our complex plane right here, we have the real axis, the imaginary axis, and we need to define some kind of contour that kind of captures this interval right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to choose two points, minus r and r on the real axis right here. And later we want r to be a really, really big number. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at negative r and walk along our real axis like so until we get to positive r. So we're going in this direction right here. And if we integrate across this path right here and take the limit as our r approaches infinity, we can actually get some kind of integral that looks like this later on. So if we want to use contour integration for this, we have to close this path off a little bit. So once we reach this r right here, why not go over in the positive half of the complex plane and kind of complete our path like that. And I'm gonna call this bigger arch right here, this semicircle, gamma. And I'm gonna call this whole entire contour here, C. All right, so we've gotten our contour and this is actually what we want to integrate our function over. And notice that the poles of our function are exactly at i and minus i. So it's going to be somewhere here, i and if we go down, minus i like so. And you see our contour actually encloses one of these poles right here. So we can actually make use of Cauchy's residue theorem when we're calculating the value of this contour. All right, so let's write everything out right now. We have the contour integral over c of a function f of z dz, which is the path we want to integrate our function over being equal to. And now we can decompose this contour into its separate paths. So first we have the path from minus r to r and then we're going to have f of x because we're walking along the real axis, so just changing to a real variable. And then we're gonna add the integral over our gamma of f of z dz. All right, very nice. So now we have three integrals we need to play around with. And this integral right here is the one we're most interested in because later we're gonna let our r's here approach infinity and this integral will help us find the actual value of our original integral right here. So first of all, let's take a look at our contour integral right here. Like I said before, we can use Cauchy's residue theorem because we have a singular simple pole in here inside of our contour. So we have the integral over our contour of f of z dz and using Cauchy's residue theorem, that's exactly two pi i times the sum of our residues of our function f of z, okay? But you see, we only have one residue we need to worry about because we only have one pole inside of our contour. So we can write this as two pi i times the residue at this singular pole. So we have the residue at the point z equals i of f of z. And what exactly is that? Well, we're just using the definition of the residue. We have two pi i times the limit as z approaches our pole i of z minus our pole times f of z, and what is that? That's two pi i times the limit as z approaches i. And then f of z, I'm gonna use this expression right here. So we have z minus i, then f of z, it's going to be z e to the i z over z plus i, and then z minus i. Okay, and the nice thing is we have z minus i here and z minus i down here. So these will cancel each other out. So after that's done, we're gonna have two pi i 
times the limit as z approaches i of z times e to the i z over z plus i and nothing will blow up here if we substitute i into these z's here so let's just do that so we're going to have 2 pi i plugging i into this c right here we're going to have i e to the i times i over i plus i down here will be 2i all right and 2i and 2i up here will cancel each other out and then we're going to be left with pi times i times e and then i times i is negative one so overall we're going to have i times pi over e so just bring this e down to the denominator using this negative power right here and this right here is exactly the value of our contour integral all right so we figured out our first part of the puzzle which is the contour integral over c and now we have to figure out what our integral over gamma is and to do this you can use jordan's lemma which you can use to show that the integral over gamma right here goes to zero in the limit as our r's here approach infinity but i'm just going to evaluate it from scratch in this video so we want to evaluate the integral over gamma of f of z so that's going to be z e to the i z and i'm going to replace it with the original definition which was z squared plus one dz okay and what we want to do with this thing here is introduce a new parameterization so the best way I think to parameterize this integral is just to do a change of variables. So we're gonna let z be equal to r times e to the i t. And we want t to be between pi and zero. And if you think about it, every single point on our gamma is a distance of r away. And we wanna start at t equals zero, so right here. And then we're gonna swing all the way over to t equals pi, which lands us at negative r. All right, and then just differentiating both sides we're going to get dz being equal to i times r e to the i i t dt and then just plugging all of this junk into here we're going to get the integral from zero to pi now of now replacing all the z's with r e to the i t so we have that e to the i r e to the i t over r e to the i t squared plus one and then dz is exactly i times r e to the i t dt all right so this is a gigantic mess right now so let's just try and clean things up a little bit first of all we're going to pull this i out to the front and then we have r e to the i t and another r e to the i t so when we multiply those together we're going to get r squared e to the 2 i t so let's just do that we're going to get i times integral from zero to pi of r squared e to the 2it e to the i r e to the it over and just expanding this bottom out we're going to get r squared e to the 2it plus 1 dt all right and this r squared here that's just a constant so let's bring that up to the front and now from here what we can do is start estimating the value of this integral so let's just get rid of this equal sign right here and then i'm going to take the absolute value of this whole entire thing right here so notice that we have two things multiplied together we have this ir squared and this whole entire integral so we can split the absolute value up to be absolute value of this part times the absolute value of the integral but the absolute value of i r squared that's exactly just r squared itself so we're going to have r squared absolute value of this whole entire thing right here all right and from here what we can do is use the integral inequality so this whole junk right here that's less than or equal to r squared times the integral of the absolute value so bring these absolute values to the inside and notice we have a whole entire bunch of stuff multiplied together so we can split the absolute values up in there so we're going to bring the absolute values in and taking the absolute value of this this thing and this whole entire thing down here e to the 2 i t that's nothing but e to the i times some real number because remember t is a real parameter so e to the i times some real number absolute value of that is always equal to one all right so let's just write everything we have down right here we have absolute value e to the i r and i'm going to expand out this e to the i t to become cosine of t plus i times the sine of t so just using euler's form right there and then we're going to divide everything by absolute value r squared e to the 2 i t plus 1 and then end absolute value dt all right we still have a little bit of a mess to deal with but if you look up on the denominator right here we can use the reverse triangle inequality to further estimate this thing right here so if you look on the denominator here we have the absolute value of r squared e to the 2 i t 
plus one. And if we want to use the reverse triangle inequality for this, we need something minus something in here. So we can actually change this plus to a double negative. So we can subtract a negative one instead. And what does the reverse triangle inequality says? It says that this thing right here, that's greater than or equal to the absolute value of the first part inside the absolute value. So R squared e to the 2it. And then I'm going to subtract the second part inside the absolute values. And then from here, we can just clean things up a bit. We have a product in here, so we can split up the absolute values. Same thing as before, e to the i times some real number, absolute value of that is exactly one and then we have an r right here but r is always a positive real number so absolute value of that is always positive so i can ignore that and then negative one right here absolute value of that is exactly one so what they do we just find out this thing right here is equal to the absolute value of r squared minus one but this whole thing right here is always positive because r is a really really big number so we can just say that it's equal to R squared minus one. So this whole junk right here is greater than or equal to R squared minus one. But notice that this is on the denominator right here. So if we take one over absolute value of R squared e to the two it plus one. If we take the reciprocal, we're gonna take the reverse of this inequality. So it's less than or equal to one over the reciprocal of this thing right here. So one over R squared minus one. Okay, so if this thing is less than or equal to this thing, that means this whole entire integral right here is less than or equal to R squared integral from zero to pi, absolute value of e to the i r cosine of t plus i sine of t over R squared minus one. But this thing right here, that's just a constant. So we'll just pull it out and then we're gonna be left with this junk in the numerator right here. All right, so this integral right here, that's equal to r squared over r squared minus one, integral from zero to pi, and then we have absolute value. And up here, I'm gonna expand out this brackets a little bit to give us a sum of two things and then split the exponential up from there. So first of all, we have e to the i r cosine of t up here. Okay, and then we're adding, so we're gonna multiply it by another exponential, e to the i times i, which is negative one. We have an r right here and then sine of t. Okay, we have product inside the absolute value, so just splitting that up. Same argument as before for this case, e to the i times some real number right here. Absolute value of that just goes to one. And then we have e to the minus r sine of t, but this part right here is a real number. So if we have e to some real number, that's always positive, so we can get rid of the absolute values from there. So this thing right here is equal to r squared, over r squared minus one integral from zero to pi of e to the minus r sine of t dt. And then here you can see what happens as our r gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Since we have this negative right here, this whole entire thing will just go towards zero. But only under certain conditions, I already talked about this in a previous video because this thing actually goes to one if our t is equal to zero or pi because sine of zero or pi is exactly zero. So we have e to the zero, which is one, which is not good. But the problem is that only happens at these endpoints right here. So if we restrict our interval from zero to pi to zero to pi again, but not including the endpoints, the integral will still be the same. And we're gonna choose this one to make sure that the integrand goes to zero. So if we take limit as our r approaches infinity, we're going to get, well, at least for this first part here, if you use L'Hopital's, it's just going to evaluate to one because it's growing at the same rate. But now we're going to have the integral from zero to pi of zero dt, because this thing's going to go to zero and that's exactly zero. So what does this result mean right here? Well, remember originally we had the integral over gamma, which we turned into some parameterized integral from zero to pi. And we actually took the absolute value of this thing to estimate it. And we found that it was less than or equal to some junk. And we found that that junk was less than or equal to zero in the limit as our r approaches infinity. But the only way for this thing to be less than or equal to zero is if it's equal to zero itself. And for something to have the absolute value of zero, well, that thing must be zero as well. So our integral over gamma in the limit as r approaches infinity just, just vanishes it, so it goes to zero. So that's pretty much Jordan's limit right there. All right, so after all that work with estimating a bunch of junk, we found that the integral over gamma, that just evaluates to zero, it contributes absolutely nothing to this 
contour right here. And now we're ready to put everything together because in the limit as our R approaches infinity, the value of our contour will still stay the same because we're still enclosing this singular pole right here and still going to be closed. So we're still going to have I pi over E. And then in the limit as R approaches infinity, this integral here will be from negative infinity to infinity of f of x. But f of x, we will just use this definition right here. It's going to be x e to the i x over x squared plus one dx. And then this thing right here in the limit as our approach is infinity, it's just going to be zero. So we're not going to bother with that. All right. Now, if you look at this integrand right here, we have this e to the i x right here, and we can actually expand that out. So if we do that, we're going to have i pi over e being equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x. And then using Euler's formula, we're going to have cosine of x plus i times the sine of x or that junk divided by x squared plus one dx and then using the linearity of the integral we can further break this apart into two separate integrals to be the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x cosine of x over x squared plus one dx plus i times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x sine of x over x squared plus one dx. And hey, this thing right here is exactly the integral we wanted to find from the very beginning. So if you have a look at the relationship between this value here and these two integrals right here, this thing right here is purely imaginary. So that means there's no real part to this. And you see this integral with the cosine right here, that's the real part of the answer. So this thing right here is in fact a zero and that actually makes sense because if you check for yourself, the integrand is an odd function and we're integrating over symmetrical bounds. So this in fact goes to zero. So what we're really left with is that i pi over e, the purely imaginary part should match up with this part right here, which is i times the integral from zero to infinity of x sine of x over x squared plus one dx. And then just canceling out the i's here. So just taking the imaginary part, we're gonna get that the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x sine of x over x squared plus one dx is exactly pi over e as we expected. So there you go. That is the final result for today's video. So uh, yep, that is pretty much it. Hope everyone enjoyed it and I will see everyone next time.